Bob Feller Show, program number six, the Boston Marathon. Track and field is a rugged sport. A runner, a high jumper, or a pole vaulter must be in peak condition and his timing perfect for this event. But there is a sport in the running field that rates as the most rugged, the marathon. Back in 1946, the Boston Marathon celebrated its 50th anniversary. It was a gala event each year and attracted runners from all over the globe. This particular year, a young Greek runner was in the field. He had about as good a chance as anyone else, according to the expert. Stanleyos Korea Cadiz was here on a mission. The 33-year-old distant runner was in the United States to obtain aid for Greece. What better way than to run in the Boston Marathon and bring attention to his nation's problems? Ten years before, at the Olympic Games in Berlin, he had finished seventh. A handful of unknowns moved quickly to the front as the long, grueling event began over the rugged Massachusetts roads. Favorite, Gerald Coate, was among the leaders at the halfway mark, but he suffered a severe stomach cramp and fell by the wayside. Korea Cadiz started to make his move and slowly passed one tiring runner after another. A Massachusetts school teacher, Johnny Kelly, had the lead as the Greek runner became a challenger, but Kelly wasn't ready to give up the front position to anyone. As the two leaders passed the 28 mile marker, they were head and head. Kelly and Korea Cadiz both had easy strides and they appeared that they could go on running forever. Kelly had an advantage as the race entered the final six miles. He knew the course, and he had won the grueling event the year before. But this was another year, another challenge, and he was certainly getting just that from the 33-year-old Greek. As Kelly and Korea Cadiz passed the 25-mile marker, they were still side by side. Will the two runners go to the finish head and head, or would another runner overtake the two leaders in the final miles? I'll be back in 60 seconds. The two runners were side by side as a rugged event moved into the final mile. This was it. Thoughts flashed through the young Greek's mind. He had to win this one. It would mean so much to so many others. Then, with only a thousand yards left, Kelly began to tire. His legs were giving out on him. His rival pulled ahead. One yard, then two. The Greek was opening daylight. Korea Cadiz was hurting too. His legs ached. In fact, every muscle in his body hurt. But he had to keep going. At the finish, the Greek was far ahead of the American rival. Korea Cadiz had won the race but it was more than just a race to him. He was a man running for his country. Bob Feller Show, program number seven. One of the most stirring sports events of the year is an annual Memorial Day 500 Classic at the Indianapolis Speedway. Drivers take their lives in their hands when they roar off on the brick oval. Each year, accidents mar the event, and often death pokes his hand into the race. The 1956 race will always be remembered because of its crashes. Shortly after the start, driver Paul Russo was rolling along in the lead when suddenly his car went out of control, did a dizzy spin, and crashed into the outer wall. A few minutes later, Jimmy Daywalt from Indianapolis smashed into the outside wall on the southeast turn. Jimmy was dragged unconscious from his car. Dick Rathman suffered a neck injury as his car slammed into the southwest wall, and so it went, one crash after another. No sooner had the wreckage from one crack up been cleared away than another would occur. Fans wondered whether one of the smashes would be fatal. Pat Flaherty, a driver from Chicago, trailed the field over the first 200 miles of the grueling race. Finally, he decided it was time to make his move. Pat, a 30-year-old likable redhead, had won the pole position for his top time in the qualifying round. But Flaherty knew he had a long grind ahead of him, a long, dangerous road. A few minutes after Pat had moved into the lead, the caution flag was up again. This time, a four-car crack up. One of the drivers involved, Californian Sam Hanks. He walked away from the mishap unharmed. And in a matter of minutes, Hanks was pushing Flaherty and the other leaders for their front position. Again, a hush fell over the thousands of fans as veteran driver Tony Bettenhausen smashed into the south retaining wall. He suffered a broken collarbone. Only 150 miles were left when Al Herman glanced off the inside wall. Hanks was now back in contention as the remaining drivers in the field roared into the final 50 miles. The stretch. I'll be back in 60 seconds with the finish. Hanks is right behind Flaherty and Red knew it. He kept his fingers crossed. No tire changes, no blowout, no gas stops. He knew he couldn't afford another stop if he wanted to win. And he wanted to win badly. He had never picked up the top prize money before. Only 20 miles to go, then 10, then 5. Flaherty still had the lead. 
but Hanks was closing in rapidly behind him. Flaherty roared across the finish line ahead of Hanks. Only 22 seconds had separated the drivers. But for an accident, on a day of accidents, Hanks would have probably won the 1956 Memorial Day Classic at the Indianapolis Speedway. Bob Feller Show, program number eight. It all started with a peach basket in a YMCA gym. Now, millions of youngsters play basketball from coast to coast. In the back of their minds, there is usually one thought, to have one big night, to score a lot of points. Let's go back a few years to Philadelphia, where a very tall basketball player was rewriting the record books at Overbrook High School. College after college, sought the very effective young point maker. He chose Kansas University, but even before he departed for college, the pros had an eye on him. They knew he was going to be great, one of the greatest ever. In his sophomore year, he led Kansas to the conference title, but he wasn't happy in school and quit before his class graduated. Abe Saperstein signed him, and he traveled with the famed Harlem Globetrotters. When he joined the Philadelphia Warriors for the start of the 1959-60 season, in no time he was rewriting the pro records. His scoring feats were fabulous, and his rebounding sensational. He was a smart basketball player, and he went about his job in a cool, methodical way. On March 22, 1962, the Warriors were playing the New York Knicks at Hershey, Pennsylvania, and it wasn't long before the fans got that feeling that this was going to be a special night. Philadelphia moved quickly to a 19-3 lead. The big guy had scored a dozen of those points. He wasn't much of a foul shooter, but this night... He stepped to the line seven times, and seven times he connected. As the buzzer ended the first quarter, a big guy had 23 points, but was far from over. In the second period, he tapped it in, hooked it in, chipped it in, and looped in his favorite fadeaway shot. At the half, the big guy had 44 points. The Warriors, especially the big guy, were cheered as they returned to the court. He couldn't miss. One basket after another went in. The fans welcomed the third quarter buzzer to catch their breath. The Warriors were ahead 125 to 106, and the big guy had scored 66 points. With one quarter to go, he needed 12 points to tie his own single-game record. He needed 34 to hit the century mark. Could he make it and do the impossible? In 60 seconds, we're back to find out. Eight minutes were left when he hit the 79-point mark, a new league record. Now the crowd was screaming for the big guy to score again and again. With 119 showing on the clock, he intercepted a pass, dribbled, and shot. The ball rimmed the basket and fell out. The crowd groaned. But he had another chance. He scored. Then another basket. The clock showed 46 seconds when the big guy took the ball with both hands, pushed it into the nets. He had scored 100 points, and the crowd went wild. The big guy, who is he? It was Wilt Chamberlain, the NBA's greatest superstar. Bob Feller Show, program number nine. There was a time when pro football was a struggling sport. In the mid-twenties, fans were reluctant to part with their money to see a pro football game. It was that way in Chicago and all the other cities where National Football League teams played, and even in New York. But on a Sunday afternoon in 1925, the owners of the New York Giants wore great big smiles. Tickets for the coming game against the Chicago Bears were selling faster than they could be printed. The reason? Red Grains. The immortal galloping ghost had set the nation talking about his grid exploits at the University of Illinois. Every school child knew who Red Grains was. Now he was a pro football star with the Bears. More than 70,000 fans jammed the polo grounds for the Giants-Bears clash, and thousands of others were turned away. There was a chill in the air as Grains and his teammates crowded out on the field. An occasional boo, but mostly cheers greeted the Bears. Grains still wore that famous number 77 the number that had become a legend in college football. A roar rocked the polo grounds as the Giants appeared on the field. A flip of a coin, and the game was on. The fans had turned out for one reason. They wanted to see Grange. So naturally, they were disappointed when Grange didn't have a hand in the first touchdown. The Bears marched slowly down the field and towards the Giants' goal line. But it was Joe Sturman who lugged the pigskin across for the score, not Grange. 
He had carried the ball only nine yards in the drive. Grange was a marked man. When the Bears went to the air, there were not two, but three defenders covering Grange. But Grange brought the crowd to its feet when he leaped high to grab a pass with defenders all around him. The play gained 25 yards and set up another Bear touchdown. But like the first touchdown, it wasn't Red who carried the ball into the end zone, but Sternemann. As the teams up the field for the halftime break, the Bears held a 12 0 lead. Giant fans were blue because their team trailed, and the thousands of other fans were disappointed because the great Red Grange had not been allowed to show off his talent. Grange even sat out the entire third quarter. The Giants scored a touchdown and added an extra point. Now it was 12 to 7 in favor of the Bears. A chorus of chants, we want Grange, echoed through the park as the final period got underway. And seconds later, Grange joined his teammates in the huddle. A whole quarter remained for Red to show the crowd his amazing talent. I'll be back in a minute. The Giants took to the air. Seconds ticked off. One pass, then another. They were on the move. Still another. But this time, Grange picked it out of the air. An interception. The crowd held its breath. He sidestepped one giant player, then another. Grange headed for the sideline. He was almost clear. Just one more player to get past. Into the end zone, he scooted for a touchdown. Reg Grange had not disappointed the thousands of fans who had come to see him play. They had seen the greatest player of his time, and maybe the greatest ever. 